And welcome back for another special edition of the Michael Deacon program. Greetings, friends and foes. We survived another week on this island earth. Much love and respect to all of you out there listening. It's coming to a close, the end of the year, finally. I can't believe how quickly this year just flew by. It's that time for predictions, boys and girls, and who better to talk to then my guest, Mr. John Hogue. In a moment, John will be with us all here, live and direct. For those who don't know, John defines himself as a rogue scholar. He is a world-renowned authority on Nostradamus and other prophetic traditions. John is a best-selling author as well as a number one bestseller of prophecy titles. Now, without further ado... Let's bring in my guest, Mr. John Hogue, who I believe is patiently waiting. Let's bring him right in if we can. John, how are you? And maybe he's still muted there. Who knows? Uh-oh, we might have an issue here with John. Did he fall asleep on us? 
Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, John. Did you have yourself muted? No, it just the computer muted, uh, the Zoom muted. Oh, that's terrible. Well, I'm glad you're here. Sometimes some folks self-mute themselves and they haven't even realized they did it. But yes, I'm glad you're here, John. Welcome back. Well, uh, a lot of people would like to silence me, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of those uh, commissar algorithms out there. <laughs> that's true. You never know. There are lots of people out there who do want to silence you. And by the way, how are you doing this evening, John? I'm doing fine. I am... Uh... I am recovering uh, this last month from having to do what will be the last time I do a deadline for a book in my life. I uh, had two unplanned books in this unique year of 2020 that I uh, had to write. The first one that would have been the 50th was uh, Nostradamus Cor Coronavirus, The Pandemic Prophecies. When I got to about finishing it around 90,000 words, suddenly it became clear 11 weeks before the election that uh, the stars, the astrology for the presidential election and the profound impact it might have for the next eight years of American and world history uh, required a second, a 51st book uh, on uh, unplanned for literary child that I had to write 110,000 word book with complicated astrological work involved in just 11 weeks. So I'm a little, I was a little tired for most of November and now I'm, I must be getting back into it because I just wrote in the last two weeks, 29 articles be published in a few days and that's about 42,000 words. So in other words, you've been really busy. These times I always, I've been, talking and writing about the 2020s, which I've called the Roaring 2020s, since uh, 35 years or so. Um, and this would be the decade that, for one thing, uh, as early as in BBC Radio Time interview I did on Landline to 1998 to England, uh, Britain, well, it might be England again soon, um, that uh basically i said after the midterm elections of 1998 in the united states i said you know if this pipe this partisan blue versus red deepens uh in the coming few decades then i we may be on the threshold of a second american civil war by 1990 oh sorry by 2020. um and uh, that's all documented. I document all my predictions. Uh, all my articles are available on hoagprophecy.com to see the um, archives that go all the way back to the year 2000. And because uh, I learned from studying Edgar Casey that it is, it is one of the great losses in prophecy that a lot of prophets, for whatever reasons, either they're afraid to be wrong or they have their ego involved in it, or they're afraid to be shown when they're wrong and maybe learn from it, that uh, like Edgar Casey used to do, he is, all his trance readings when he was under were documented, filed away, and date tagged. And I learned from that to do the same thing with everything I say so I can understand an important thing that everyone needs to understand, whether they're listening to me or making prophecies or both, is how we filter the signs we get from another dimensional whatever source and taint them like tea into pure water with our perceptions, our hopes and fears. And looking at my own mistakes, uh, I have learned much about how, how subtle the mind is. And since my, my main life's passion beyond all the writing is to be on the path of no mind fullness, self-observant scientific meditative techniques, which I learned from India, from Osho, my teacher, is since 1980, um, that I bring into this field a, uh, what I contend is a unique dimension of really just trying not to have any ego identified dog in the fight. Right. Understood. I look at the world. I look at the world as if I was looking at it in this eternity of the present from the context of a few hundred years in the future, where 
So when I look at presidential predictions, which I've been doing uh, since 1968, predicting the popular vote winner in the United States since 68 says 52 years uh, with Biden winning the popular vote. I'm once now I'm 14 and zero. But I also tried something new, a possible new winning streak. We'll see uh, concerning uh, Trump, because 13 months before Trump was elected in an upset, I had written that, looking at his astrology, that he was the only person who had a chance on the Republican side to beat Hillary Clinton better than she politically usually beats herself. Understood. And so... So the stars were aligned for Trump, in other words. Yes, I'd never seen any candidate with better signs on the 8th of November 2016. So if Trump had managed to get through all the hoops and get there... Uh, he was the only person who, of all the 20 or plus people originally that were there, 18 that were serious at it, that he kind of annihilated with his his perfect mirror reflective way of bouncing negativity back on people who are being negative with him, not knowing that the, actually the best way to beat Trump is to love him rather than spew your bile at him, um, is that uh, he... He would then be elected uh, in an upset, and that happened. So I thought, well, let's see, since he won the Electoral College, what I call the unpopular vote, um, that I did a try in my newest book, John Hogue's Presidential Predictions for 2020, which is available uh, at hogueprophecy.com, to um, look not only at the presidential election, but also to look at these Fascinate, the fascinating story of these, this uh, conjunction, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which has somehow aligned itself since 1840 with a famous curse, one of the most famous curses in the United States history from the, an Indian, from a Native American from the Great Lakes Confederation that had risen with the tribes, thought they were being invaded and overcrowded by the Europeans coming into their area. Uh, his younger brother, Tecumseh, became the commander of the uh, Indian Confederation. And they were defeated by the uh, governor of the Indiana Territory, William uh, Her uh, well, Harrison was his name, who later became president of the United States in the 40 election under a Jupiter conjunction. The, the thing that happened then was that uh, his brother, the, the prophet, as he was called, his brother died in a battle with him. And Tecumseh became the name, his brother, dead brother's name for this is Galloway, it's a really hard pronounced name, uh, prophecy that he said, Harrison will die, I tell you. And, and every 20 years, a generation, uh, will the whites lose a chief in their tribe. And when they do, they shall remember my dead people. And, and so it, you know, everybody said, well, it's just a sore loser. Uh, but then 20 years, well, several decades later, a much older Harrison ran for president, won uh, in March 3rd uh, in uh, 1841. He made his inauguration speech in a driving rainstorm. He took off his beaver top hat so that everybody could see his graying lock, his big graying mane of hair in the public. So he made his speech and that hot cold and he died of pneumonia uh, 31 days into his presidency. And then in brief, what then happened in like clockwork, every Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, the a chief of the United States in office died. It started 20 years later, 1860, Abraham Lincoln, very powerful Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that was he elected under, and he ruled during a very trying time of the American Civil War and was assassinated early in his second term. 20 years later, you have Garfield in 1880, shot at a Washington, D.C., railway station in the back by somebody who wanted a job that he didn't get from man, from president. 20 years later after that, President McKinley and uh, was reelected second term 1900 under the same conjunction. He is shot point blank by a arsonist 
or ar uh, a non arsonist, a, a um, anarchist. And uh, the 20 years after that, uh, no one shot, but uh, Harding, President Harding, died of Harding of the arteries, I suppose, and uh, he died in you know, under the Jupiter Saturn conjunction. 20 years after that, in 1940, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, musing about the future with the looming Second World War approaching, decided to break with tradition and run for a third unprecedented term under one of the most powerful Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions. Literally had Taurus, also it was over the inauguration day with, with Jupiter and Saturn, two degrees Taurus. It is always in the earth signs, fire signs, and water signs. Uh, and it's important to hold that thought because of the one time it happened in the air signs, but not yet. 20 years, because what happened to Roosevelt is he also had, a t like Lincoln, a terrible burden of being a leader in fighting the Axis forces in World War II. And um, also like Lincoln, he could see victory coming, but he died in office in his fourth term from a brain aneurysm just a few weeks before the victory in Europe was attained, and a few months before victory in the East over Japan was attained. 20 years later, it gets more into our memory. John F. Kennedy is also, uh, his election happens under a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. And John F. Kennedy, with all these leaders, there's always something really heavy, a really heavy task that they have to deal with. And of course, that was the beginning of civil rights legislation and also the Cuban Missile Crisis, which nearly destroyed the world. Um, he, he was assassinated on the 22nd of November, 1863. Strangely enough, if he had managed to go into a second term, he was actually very ill with adrenal disease. And it, we will never know, but it might have been very likely that he would have died in the second term if he was reelected in 1964. Then we come to the one time in Libra, an air sign, the one time since 1840 that all of these chiefs of the European white American nation died in office. Um, was when Ronald Reagan was coming out of the hotel, the Baxter Hotel, or Washington Hotel in, in Washington, D.C., and Hinckley Jr. fired a, a flurry of bullets that wounded a lot of his entourage and also wounded him. And he almost died on the operating table because he was so healthy for his age and not showing that he'd really been hit. The bullet had gone under his armpit and lodged near his heart, down to his heart or near rib, and they didn't see it. And he, he, he almost bled out, So, but he survived. Yeah, that's right. And now, now that means something's changed in this uh, curse. It's evolved. It's beginning to evolve into something else because 20 years later, well, that's the theory I had. And we would see in the next 20 years when we had the election of Al Gore versus George W. Bush. And in that, it did change. I made a prediction at that time that uh, during the recount that Gore had actually won a majority of votes in Florida that would have given him the electoral college votes he didn't get from his own home state of Tennessee to become legally the president of the United States. There were a lot of, a lot of cat calls about that. Until a year later, there was only, uh, the cat calls were replaced by crickets when uh, a group of uh, press organizations funded the recount that was never done of all the undervotes and overvotes of the dangling chads in Florida and because all the votes were stored. And so they, they counted it and actually Gore won by 76 votes. So it doesn't matter if it was one vote, it means he was the legal uh, um, president and then an illegitimate president, George W. Bush was picked. So I started to think, wow, it looks like it's not just, it's now moved from actual assassination or death in office to political assassination. And uh, similarly to what's just happened today, right. the Supreme Court 
kind of, well, they heard the case, but they basically shot it down. And here we go 20 years later with what I'm calling in one of my newest articles, Donald Trump being gored again. Uh, nice wordplay, by the way. Different, thank you. Love that. In a, in a different way. And this, this is where I've been trying to convey in words what's, what's, what the fraud in the voting really is. And what has happened, what I've always been worried about is that in 20 years after 2000, that the curse is now reaching its climax to be actually a curse against our democracy. That, that it's, it's collapse uh, from this election. Um, you don't think I it was dead before, John? Come again? You don't think it was already dead before? Well, it well it hasn't actually descended into the corporate fascism that I've also been seeing for four years coming into 2020, but it's very close. I see. The reason why I say that, though, John, just really quickly, is because some would say that JFK was the last real president. Well, it, it, people can bandy semantics. I deal with um, I deal with the. Uh, yeah, the reality is that, uh, yeah, maybe you could say uh, 30 years ago when you chain smoked two packs a day that the cancer that couldn't be seen was created in 1960 that only comes out in the doctor's examination all these years later. And then most people go, oh, wow, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't have cancer for 40 years and here it is, cough, cough, puff, puff. And so you might say, certainly, that that was the stages. There have been stages. I think Oliver Stone and, and JFK did a marvelous job of, right. of meeting fact with myth. And I mean myth in, a, in its true, in its higher sense of the word. Um, myth is one of those rich words in our lexicon. It literally can be in its lowest meaning, charlatanism and flim flam, um, you know, and or it can mean a truth that's higher than and perennial than fact something that transcends time and fact and and so it certainly was the beginning you could also say that the military industrial complex speech of eisenhower presaged this situation before kennedy so you could even say that um but what is and then you could certainly say that on the 26th of january 2010 the the real rollout of a creeping corporate coup d'etat on this country began when Citizens United was ruled by the Supreme Court, which has been heavily packed, not just left and right, but with part, bipartisan pro-corporate judges, uh, basically wiped out John McCain and, and Senator Ken Kerry's uh, efforts to get money laundry or money out of political uh, elections and open the gates wide because with the magic wave of a wand from a fairy god supreme court justice um, right. uh, they created people out of uh, out of corporations it's like um, and therefore uh, these people who are called Exxon, Mobile, whatever you know or now um, Amazon uh, the new, the new oligarchic people, Amazon, Google, Facebook, YouTube, um, these people and many others, and all the all the folks that that are the who's who of the military industrial complex that Biden is gathering in his uh, cabinet. Um, these uh, quote unquote people have a lot of money that they can use to buy free speech and. Therefore, I remember my brother, my old brother told me he was driving on the freeway and only heard on the radio on that very day. And he said, well, that means we've just lost the United States Republic. And, you know, it's a creeping catastrophe. Usually the ones that human beings are not very good at stopping, like climate crisis that we're in. And, and so it creeped for the next 10 day page right up. And unfortunately, my prediction was right on time with 2020. And now here we are with the election that sets the stage. The astrology for either possibility of the four people that could potentially become president, whether it's Harris Biden or Pence Trump, um, I got the sense from the astrology 
that neither man will finish his term. Really? And and so the vice president choices in both cases are equivalent to study. And I studied them. I studied first the election day, uh, where the Jupiter Saturn conjunction had a major impact, more than the other elections that I have seen. And and then it also looked at the so I composite charted all four to the election day, and then I did a composite chart chart where we compare aspects of the U.S. birth chart under Scorpio rising to all of them. I then uh, looked at inauguration day itself and how they all compared, and it just got more dramatic as I went along. Oh my. Uh, I, it was a unhinging my jaw dropping <laughs> moment, which I don't often have because I'm I'm skeptical in the true sense of the word, not cynical like most people misuse skepticism. I don't front load an opinion and look to find my opinion, whether it's blind faith in, in it or like so many people think Nostradamus can do no wrong. Well, it's because they're just finding the shapes of his cloudy verse that look like the things they imagine are there. Um, and at the same time, there is something there, but one has to get over one's own program need to make a world fit a worldview and never doubt or question your own perception, your own awareness. Right. What meditation techniques of Osho have shown me is how that is absolutely necessary to see how you tick how you've had this coding of a personality which means mask in ancient latin and greek over you that you've been taught how to i mean this is the very engine of predictability that makes prophecy uh in its unconscious use um so predictable is that generations after generations since the beginning of the human race have been being programmed by a come in fresh, open, unconsciously enlightened potentials that are then given identities, names, religions that they should worship, religions that they should hate, countries they worship and hate, and basically see division, identity is a, a ruling of each individual by being di di divided by themselves. And and basically, all of this leads to um, a very mechanical human being in, a, in a, a drone in millions of very mechanical human beings who are like machines, somewhat predictable, and because they're following patterns of programming. The thing that makes me wonder when back in 1990, when I wrote the Millennium Book of Prophecy, which was released in 1994, I did a test of a control group of that rare group of prophets around history who documented dated predictions sometimes years or centuries into the future that were accurate. It's the hardest thing to do in prophecy because it requires so many unconscious mechanical habits and behaviors of individuals and collective groups to come to that happening. Um, he, the, so the, the control group of these very brilliant prophets, I did a timeline in the crossroads, uh, chapter that got up to the year 2000 and climax in a lot of really accurate dates and then started petering off after the, in the next two decades, um, into the 21st century. And then of that control group of accurate prophets, there were only a few prophecies like, um, Cairo, um, Count Louis Hamond, uh, had the Messiah coming in 2025, and he'd usually been so accurate. He's, a Victorian, he's kind of a Victorian James Bond figure, the spy for the British Empire, but he also was a, a, a mystic and searching out all kinds of things. Uh, it's quite a story. Right. I'll probably write a book about it at some point. The other the other uh, one was Nostradamus's famous final dated prophecy about just shy of 1800 years in our future, the year 3797 AD. Um, and so, but after that, nothing. I mean, and before that, just a couple, a handful. Uh, it, it was almost like if this were the, uh, the margin of 
cosmic dust that everybody found that in the in the layers of the earth indicated 65 million years ago where there was all this life in the layers fossils below and there's hardly anything on the next for a while this this was equivalent to that in prophecy that suddenly there seemed to be no future for the human race so the question i in meditation that came up for me was we have an option right now and especially it begins in the 2020s it climaxes in the 2030s is literally we've reached this point where the human race uh, has to redefine itself and break with its identification with the past and i emphasize that because there's nothing wrong with remembering the lessons of the past but to think you are the past is like thinking you are there's no driver in your car but the car which was built in the past that you happen to be watching driving down the road but have forgotten to drive the wheel because you've been programmed not to drive the car with a wheel you've been you come in as a sole driver in the body mind vehicle and within seven to 14 years you're well on your way to without you even being aware of it until you can look in that you you're being told by your society essentially to identify as the body mind car that's you and to altogether forget the, the eternal consciousness that you really are the buddha everybody's seeking for millions of lives because you they've forgotten they've heard the buddha and how can you find yourself if you're always chasing after yourself correct you know, how do you know the dog uh, is attached to the tail unless you re that you're trying to catch for thousands of lives until you see the act with something that is deeper than your mind and your heart but it's connected to the body mind through the heart and that is the perfect mirroring consciousness that everyone is or put it another way the consciousness is the oceanic water of every part of it shaped into an identified wave and so so what that means then is the that there's two possible futures coming at us in the next 20 years we either through the mixed unexpected blessing of confronting the systemic collapse of human civilization as we worked with it with egocentricness uh facing it's and i'll tell you in five years or a little more everybody that's listening to this radio show is even if you think i'm a batty fellow for talking this way uh for people who deny these things are happening i simply say look i'm not even going to debate it anymore i don't have any more time i i'm here to talk to people who are all ready to listen and I accept and, and respect the freedom of those equally who do not wish to listen because consciousness is absolute freedom. That's the hypothesis of meditation. So uh, we are absolutely free to destroy ourselves or not, individually or collectively. There's no God imaginary friend out there to save you from yourself because you are the divine yourself. And, and it's again it's like the person you know if god were superman superman had a really bad dream and he woke up one morning hops out of bed in a cold sweat and says i've got to i for i've lost superman i've got to find him so he gets up he takes a shower he brushes his teeth he puts on his glasses his fedora hat his suit his clark kent suitcase or briefcase and crashes through the window flying around all over the world trying to find Superman as Clark Kent, his alias, his uh, surface mask, so that Superman can be okay in the world. And, uh, uh, and so this is the problem. In a way, when we're searching for God, we're doing the same thing. God's within. It's not, uh, it, you know, it's not this imaginary friend for children becoming an imaginary friend for adults. And the problem is most of the religions that uh, believe in eschatological end times are literally programming for thousands of years the human race to believe that, um, that the destruction of this earth is necessary for our salvation. These are death cults in, in very nice terms, but they are 
on the surface, but essentially if people listen to these kind of prophetic ideas, whether they're even aware of it or not, they will create, if they don't become more aware, a world that will be over-consumed, over-populated, and because they've been taught to say this is temporary world, and they will destroy it. And that is basically, and, you know, so uh, the thing that's happening is that uh, the, your, the world, the world of humanity is going to divide into two possible groups. And this is uh, in the Hopi prophecies, as in many other prophecies that I've studied. If one can look at it without the Sunday school, Friday school or Saturday school, uh, religious indoctrination of the Jewish religion, which is the mother religion of the Islamic and Christian religions. Oh, the, the top, I'll finish in a moment, the top eschatological um, uh, doomsday ending religions. Now, go ahead, Michael. Oh, it was just saying, oy vey, that's all. Oh, okay. Um, ach, about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, so this is a time that is actually quite, if you're into truth, if you want to find out what's real and not live by your dreams, because you've come to understand that every dream is a nightmare on the other side of the coin, which completely affects the holder in identity of that is truth. And so if, if you're that kind of spiritual rebel, then um, the way you embrace in the art of life what is coming in these coming times is um, to actually choose to embrace the unknown future and adapt to it. That's all we can do. Let go yeah. of identifying with the past. Um, as the Hopi used to say, and still do, uh, when the great purification starts, which is starting the 2020s, is the destruction of the fourth world or the renewal of the world through fire uh, to a new world and a restart for the human race. Right. And it is, um, and they said for a majority of the people, they would just not be ready. That means they were too identified with themselves in the past of an age that's dying and they will hold on to it and drop dead rather drop dead from their own fear of change and 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 themselves as well and that's their freedom to do if they don't know that that's their freedom or not is their freedom not to know and certainly for those of us who are not missionaries but would like to share a another possibility merely share it and then respect the freedom of people to let it in or or not and it's absolutely fine we respect freedom above all because it's where it is the very name of consciousness but also when you are more free you need to be more aware and response able to be free to live spontaneously in the moment with your full attention, genius, and perception, ready, ready to innocently respond with an innocent intelligence to things that are uh, coming your way. So in that way, I come to the point here of the conclusion of what then caused the dates of predicting to end. Is it because we've destroyed the world in the next 20 years and destroyed ourselves? and ended the line, and there's those few dates from Count Louis Haman, Cairo, and his pen name, and Nostradamus, which shows that there's still a potential for a future. Not only that, Nostradamus indicates in that prophecy that the world is destroyed, uh, where the sun devours the earth in 3797 AD, but the races, the ethnographies, he called them, one of his strange words, um, meaning that uh, are not there, that right. they have gone to live for a time in Aquarius and for perpetual time in Cancer. Now, that's the only time that he talked about these astrological 
signs as places to go. And that, that little shift in syntax is revelatory, I contend, in, in meaning that he is saying, and the reason why it's his last dated prediction is that he no longer has the reference of Earth to tell time in an earth history time he can only say where they went and then sounds very much like a a uh, earth uh, humanity j takes the jump into its galactic uh civilization steps about 1800 years or before 1800 years from now so for that to happen there has to be a humanity that obviously or enough of a humanity that obviously broke their connection, their identification, ego identification with the past, and survived to create a new human race as foretold by the Hopis and dozens of other traditions. If you can look at the essence of what they're saying in post-apocalyptic prophecies, um, uh, they all share that they're more communal, that they're more sharing each other, they're more loving, and they're, they use science because they're more aware, not in the destruction of, of the earth but to improve it and perhaps take a thousand years to terraform this earth to some more civilized uh climate because we've baked we've already baked into the system a 130 foot rise in the sea in the next few centuries and unfortunately it's coming faster than than later uh for 35 years i've been saying that the um the releases of things that, that they've been predicting for oceans rising and and the um great droughts and famines are, are not from climate change are not going to happen at the end of the 21st century, but much sooner. And I've always felt without any science at the time, but an intuition that either I'm an alarmist or, or uh, the, the message is that it's coming much sooner. So I look at, I respect the intuitive oracular of you, and then I watch to see is what happens in the world and the science over the next 30, 40 years. And became aware that, uh, and actually crystallized the awareness of it just in the last few years, then had to go through a deep grieving process for the world and people, uh, which was necessary so that I could accept it, accept my grief, and also clarify myself to be of help. What do you mean by that, by the way? I, I'm being dyslexic. I started with the end and the beginning so, to pluck your interest. So now I'll <laughs> go to the, um, that part. Um, what, is ha what is happening? And the people who are involved in the Extinction Rebellion movement have passed through this process as well. Um, basically, the human race, uh, the scientists, following their conditioning unconsciously, have always lowballed the the best case scenario for their scientific conclusions for the last 30, 40 years. And what now, because the the uh, evidence uh, as it gets more improved and the technologies make it clearer just exactly what this scene of a crime is saying, the crime against our own earth and our own future, um, it is now becoming quite clear and by the way, for those who deny this, um, uh, to actually be more alarmist does not get you funding. It, funding is removed from those who would be telling what's really coming on. So, you know, the more calmer, gentler version, it gets funding. But now even that has to stop because the data is there. Um, and it is um, quite... Uh, the thing that I always felt was a danger and i wrote about it as early i started confirming my statements about this as early as 1983 but especially in the early 90s when right. i was starting to become a best-selling author is my concern about some of the great uh, engines that sequester carbon and methane in our atmosphere they're natural engines of the living earth that, that uh, are like a balancing scale. Um, uh, on the one scale is all the immense amount of CO2 that's pumped into the system atmosphere every year. 
And equally, the balancer on the other scale is the one that sequesters it as growing plants, trees, grass, permafrost, um, or, or uh, etc. And also, um, yeah, so that's one thing. Now, if you look at what we've actually added since the uh, beginning of the industrial age to the present time, it is an equivalent extra amount of carbon of 175 um, thousand, uh, 175 gigatons over this period, which of, well, of which 30, the last, the, the two thirds of it has been put in the atmosphere since the 1980s. That's another new shocking. These are the kind of shocks that make you want to grieve uh, about what happens. Um, the other thing that's happening is that the uh, 30, year, 30 year studies have come through on studying 500,000 trees for 30 years in the, in the Central Africa and Amazon rainforests and keeping a record of their change, their growth, uh, what happened to them and how much they were able to sequester air or uh, a carbon to create air. And the conclusion they came to is that um, just recently in the last year is that um, the sequestering engines of the rainforest will begin their collapse in 2035. They will become carbon emitters, not sequesterers. So they'll be literally from the tipping of 175 gigatons of, of carbon that the industrial age has put into this system, we put an itty bitty gram on the, uh, on the sequestering side of that scale and it's beginning to tilt. And so if it tilts, and there's also some interesting things going on in the, um, in the Siberian Arctic that I've been warning people since 2009, end of 2009, uh, that from 2010 on, there was going to be a temperature tsunami caused by the greatest volcano that's not, no one's able to see it because it's not really a volcano. It's caldera is the circumference of the Arctic Circle. And if you could see it, it would be a huge super volcano of invisible gases, mostly methane that are leaking out of the permafrost fields of the Arctic at, at a major rate. And they're now starting to boil in the East Siberian continental shelf. Um, there's the science that was done. One of the best books that documents this is Dar Jamail's The End of Ice. And I strongly recommend because we don't have time to go into the nitty gritty of the science. But if you want to see and what this is about, I, that's one book I would suggest um, that the, the scientists did a helicopter research over a hundred square mile, very small part of this very large continental shelf, the largest, shallow, one of the shallowest on the planet in the Arctic Ocean. And what they were able to count was 60 billion separate columns of methane boiling out of that 100 square mile area of a much larger area. They didn't have the funds to look at the whole area but what that could mean is what they call it is the great methane burp. The other great sequestering agent uh, is the permafrost's ability to keep all of the biota and stuff that they've been piling and, and also to keep the, um, the um, hydrates of methane, which are semi-frozen in the continental shelf from beginning to melt into hydrates and, um, or cathodes, sorry gases back into the atmosphere. Basically, the sinks of carbon are releasing. And what that could potentially do in a few days or, or a few decades, uh, it could be unzipping 50 gigatons of methane into the system. Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse blocking sun um, trapping gas in the atmosphere. Uh, so if you were to translate methane into the currency of being CO2, that would mean we will be adding, since this all began in the industrial age's beginning, two thirds more carbon to the tilt of those scales in a few months, a few years, a decade or two. 
I think it, from what I'm seeing, it's more like a decade. So it changes the whole game. It brings all the stuff that people were talking about back, back in the 1980s, uh, when there were 5 billion people, uh, about all this stuff coming only at the end of 2080s, 2090s. It now brings it up into the 2030s and the 2020s. And now the science is beginning to openly admit this. And so, um, we literally are um, faced with a sixth mass extinction, a sixth in the story of the Earth's history that we are creating. And you know what? It's probably what every potentially sentient species has undergone, a variation on this theme. If there are other civilizations out, out there that have survived this, they've had to pass through this process of being unconscious of their own godliness, and therefore irresponsible because an imaginary friend has all the judgment and responsibility over them and have created literally we have become the first successful terraformers of this planet but we've done it mindlessly and unconsciously to to the point that we have we are now changing the balances of nature to basically cancel ourselves out certainly at a civilization that can function like we're functioning. So, so it's, it will be around, there's going to be four more years before people, enough people collectively on the planet understand that we are, our future is under threat. Our existence is under threat. And what I'm hoping will happen is the shock of this, a good shock, a good shock is where this creeping catastrophe starts to move from smelling the smoke to feeling the heat, but not seeing it anywhere in our house, our planet. And then it starts erupting. And then it becomes, in our perception, a short-term problem that we can fix. It's like all the decades that built a step-by-step -step the pathway to the Second World War and fascism. We're all there before. There were prophets seeing it. There were people warning of it. And everybody were just as complacent as we are today or kicking it down the road. Issues of economics that are not functioning, issues of politics that aren't functioning would happen 80 years ago or so in what is called the last catastrophe, danger point of the planetary history, the fourth turning. The last fourth turning was the Great Depression of the 1930s that paved the way for a rise of totalitarian regimes in Soviet Union and other places, Nazi Germany, Italy, Japan, and led to the uh, Second World War. Um, it climaxed with the Second World War. And then we started a period, especially in America, of a new generation of growth, tremendous growth. Not, it's something that the Chinese are beginning to experience uh, something similar to what we did when we built our infrastructure, we, um, wages were great. Um, the actual uh, taxes of the rich were much higher. Uh, and, and yet that was the most prosperous time up into the 60s. And then the children of that generation became the second turning. And that is the generation of affluence that has the luxury to look at spiritual truth and question authority. And that's why the 60s into the 70s, a little into the 80s were, were that time from the late 60s into the mid 80s was a time of the flower children, hippies, alternative cultures, and, and embracing by an entire generation of Eastern thought uh, for the very simple reason that maybe it was just because it was different from what we were all programmed in Western thought. All of that happened in that period. By 1985, uh, or towards the end of the 80s, we came into the third turning, which is the slow and gradual corruption and decline of the cycle where, you know, everything has a life cycle in this mortal universe that we are eternally visiting, um, that uh, as an eternity watching it, uh, that have gone to, uh, you know, we've seen the systems of politics slowly break down, of economy, uh, inflation, all these things started happening, getting deeper and deeper, and the leadership and the people didn't seem to be able to 
even want to care about it or look at it. Uh, these guys more thoroughly entertained with bread and circuses and, and uh, whether on a cell phone or in Colosseums. And a lot like Rome, um, things just started to come undone until the second financial crisis came around mid-decade. You know, there were signs of it, the famous 2007, 2008 Great Recession. Mind you, when the Great Recession of 1929 and the early 1930s happened, they never called it the Depression until it was over. So I consider this so-called Great Recession no different. And basically, the, the economy has been on a IV system of, of quantitative easing, uh, playing around with um, the, it's happening all over the world, with banking, central banking systems, financial speculation. And basically, what happened is that we are now entering we, the first half of the, well, the 2010s were basically the, um, the first part of the 20 years emergency period. And now we're entering, um, you know, maybe 2005 it started. So by 2015, we started entering the, the harder, more powerful, intense part of the, the fourth turning that we're in now, which will come to a climax by the middle of what well, starts to get really hot in this year for the next four years. And then it comes to a crisis uh, where people are aware they have to pitch together and change and try to save the future for the human race and, and their spot on this planet, climatologically, which we're altering to the place where we can't live here anymore. Um, and, and try to stave at least the greater part of the damage that will happen in the 2030s, because I can tell you two degrees Celsius, we've already baked it into the system the Paris Accords are just spinning their wheels uh, when they think that this is going to be that even a 30% reduction in 2030 is going to work. They're already seeing that that's not possible. And in fact, we need to do an 80% uh, percent reduction of fossil fuels uh, by 2030 if we've got a chance. So unfortunately, the scenario I hope does not happen. I don't wish to scare you, but I do compassionately wish to shock you with what I'm about to say, because, and I, I shock you lovingly, not because I want you to be afraid, but I want you to wake up to the, the challenge, the most important challenge that's ever faced humanity, individually and collectively, uh, will begin to be seen by hopefully enough people in the world to start rolling up their sleeves and dealing with it. But the process that we're facing because we're coming to this very late uh, in this in this uh, problem. Uh, the house is really on about to burst into flames, as it were. And a lot of the house is not going to survive it. So the question is, what can we do to preserve our civilization to to make it better to uh, and fortunately, astrology dictates that there will be an opening in the mid 2020s through the latter half of the 2020s where people will be more open on a collective level these windows happen in history every once in a while the astrology of judicial or political astrology can look at this Nostradamus used that in his prophecies and i use it as well as a structure to it is that you get a situation where um the um uh, the there are times when even people who are not seeking truth or just living their lives and kind of robotically will feel it, a, a feeling to think differently, to feel differently, to, to try new things rather than just completely be stuck in the past, past habitual ways of dealing with stuff. Because it'll be so clear that what we've known including the so-called Green New Deal, are completely inadequate to what's before us. So the thing that will then happen is that the, um, the danger, the shock of it will bring out human intelligence. It has happened before. I have the precedent of the last fourth turning to give as an example. 
in the six years of World War II, and before that, in the efforts of in Germany as in, and in America to kind of bring the population together to rebuild the infrastructure, the autobahns in Germany, uh, the, the the water systems, the great work programs of FDR. I mean, they they weren't actually making a profit, but they were getting people back to work. They were getting people back to prepare for a better America. Just like the Chinese have just learned by doing the same work for building roads and infrastructures at an amazing pace in the last 20 years. Because they're kind of in that position, that evolution of their life cycle as the modern China. And in our evolution, we are um, needing to do what Americans do best, reinvent themselves. And uh, the crisis that we're about to enter is definitely just like the crisis of the Civil War during the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction of that time with Lincoln's leadership um, helped through a terrible war us uh, bleed out and rebirth ourselves. A similar thing this is happening, which my book on the presidential predictions is talking about in detail, making it kind of something worth seeing for at least a... Uh, well, another eight years, uh, what I have in there to read. Basically, what I discovered looking at the astrology, now I'm going to focus a little more on America for a moment, is, is, the, is the pattern that Pluto is about in three years to return to an exact conjunction, the great generational ruler of the outer world, uh, at 27 degree, degrees Capricorn, where it was at the moment of the birth of the United States of America on July 4th, 1776. So in the next three years, we will literally be, our entire cycle of generational American history will come full circle to its beginning. And so we have also are going to undergo a death process of everything we've known about this country in the first in these next four years and in the four years following when the these these one by one these very strong powerful earth transits of uranus in Taurus, um saturn is already about to leave in a few days capricorn pluto in capricorn these are all establishment the system the established order ruling situation with Uranus and its fall in Taurus is actually beginning to destabilize the establishment up until 2026 in revolutionary times. So, so we're heading for uh, the, the old system breakdown in all the levels of society, economy, ecology, politics, leadership, and our public responsibility, which has also been lost. Um, uh, through a, a systematic literary um, degenerating uh, the literacy of our political responsibilities as American citizens of a republic by, by in the 80s taking out all the civics classes. Um, so people don't even know what their constitution that they should know uh, has uh, as a document for their rights and freedom and responsibilities. So so anyway, that's all coming into a collapse, and it's coming in this uh, 20 years after 2000. Now it's it's a it's a national wide systemic collapse of the voting system, and the 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 thing that's fraudulent about this is not what the Trump people mistakenly tried to uh, affidavit and all of that of the actual snafus that happened on the third of November, but what they should have done has brought a case against all of the um, all of the executive branches of so many states upwards of 17 that because of covid uh, decided that they had the power and even counties within these states had the power to change state electoral laws most of which were to loosen securities to make sure people that these ballots were actually represented by people who voted. Over 80 million of these ballots were sent out. And because the system is being asked to watch itself, 
the, the biggest problem why we can't even deal with what is broken in this is that um, the laws were changed to make it very easy for fraud to happen. So that it was already over by that time. Uh, now, I thought that Trump might still win the unpopular vote, uh, and I put that in the book, but the Electoral College or the other, the Article 12 of the Constitution, which allows the House of Representatives to vote for one vote per state, or it could very well happen that we're going to see a similar thing that happened in 1878, early 1878, after the Tilden Hayes dispute in that, that uh, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, presidency where he won without the popular vote because there were states that were considered that they, they their, their electoral collegiates who were voted, they were deemed uh, untrustworthy because of the system of the way they voted. This sounds very much like what's being bandied around about now in American politics. And so there's still a possibility by the 5th or 6th of um, January that uh, there's this thing will still be up in the air, especially since there are two senators uniquely, it's rarely ever happening that this happens in the same state. Two senators are up for a, uh, a, an election on the 5th, which could literally define at least the next two years of either giving the Democrats complete power or the three tiers of um, these two tiers of the constitutional powers, or there will be a mitigating Republican paper thin um, uh, majority that will actually make this, the atmosphere more compelling to let's work together because uh, so the danger is whether it's either party having all the power, it becomes a one party system. And that's very dangerous uh, because power does not corrupt. Power does not corrupt absolutely. I think there's a lot power. of people out there, John, who want a one party system. Well, yes. And look, look how that worked in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. And right, and, right. And uh, I mean, again, illiteracy well people have like, the lack uh, of common really sense right. a lot of people are <laughs> thinking socialism is a is going to be better than this monopolistic socialism capitalistic socialism of the rich which is now i mean both systems uh have their faults any if, if you think you want to live with socialism find some friend or contact that grew up in eastern europe and the soviet union and then you'll see how good that is Equally, if you want to see what happens when corporations become synonymous with the, their politicians, where business actually runs, pays for, and banks the politicians, not rather than the people, yeah. you are looking at the end of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Chancellor Hitler in the early 30s. It won't be the same here, but that's highly likely in both cases because this, this corporate fascism is about to complete. It is complete, actually, its cycle with this year. But with the astrological with the with the leaving of Saturn out of, out of uh, Capricorn, and then eventually in four years, the, the final degrees of the same thing happening with a very important Pluto in Capricorn, and then following a shortly after that, Uranus going out of Taurus into Gemini, you will find a lot of the things that were in opposition and square will be in harmonious trine beginning in the following four years, which means there's forward progress into redefining and recreating the United States, hopefully uh, with a refreshed understanding of our, because of all we're going to go through in the next four or eight years of of what's uh, what happens when you take your freedoms for granted. Right. Well, right now we are experiencing a acceleration point right now. This, what I like to refer to as an acceleration era to the cyber gods, all those nice companies, those nice corporations you listed just now, Facebook, Amazon, uh, even Twitter, Instagram, you know, all these corporations they've all become bigger than government and we're seeing the outcome of right of that take place right now in real time john yeah that's that's exactly the um the uh 
the formula for uh, when when corporations become bigger and actually control. Um, it's a, called a plutocracy or an oligarchy. It's 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 America. It's North, this North American land becoming very quickly a South American banana republic with nuclear weapons. And it's, it's strange because um, as, as we become more like the Soviet Union, there's some interesting prophecies from Sturio Johansson, who was called the Edgar Cayce back mm -hmm. in the 80s of, of, of Sweden. And he channeled a man named, um, I can't remember the name of Mullins, the spirit, but anyway, they're very accurate prophecies. And um, he used to say that there would be two Colossi that would fall at the end of the Cold War, either peacefully or at war. The first one to fall, well, is the, is the Russians when the Cold War ended in 1989, a few years later. And he said the, the more, and then America would remain, uh, but it would also fall as a hegemonic power as well uh, in the future. And he made this interesting riddle. He said, "The more, the more, uh, as time goes by, Russia will become freer, as the United States becomes more like the Soviet Union." I mean, there are certain things we're already doing. Now, you just mentioned, you know, a a cabal of Silicon Valley people and a few people up here in Seattle area. Yeah. Um, that as well, and these handful of people, not only are they incredibly wealthy and have much of the wealth of the human race in their hands, they got it all the political free speech of that wealth to basically, um, to basically dictate how you can think they can shape how your elections will turn out, which is just what happened. Um, they they will deplatform you if you have a uh, con, uh, a voice a dissenting voice. I mean, I've I've seen it on Facebook sometimes where it, I will see this robot thing come up, and they said, "We know what you're doing. You are doing." And it sounds it's like it's like a we're not even at least the Soviet citizens had to deal with a flesh and blood commissar, a political officer berating them and threatening them. I'm threatening, I'm threatened by machines, by a mathematics. And so are so many other people on the left, right, and center. The thing they all share is free thinking and questioning and being inquiring about the way things are. Uh, I mean, and I'm coming from a place of some responsibility and experience. I, I worked since 1987 and all as a professional guest on 200 documentaries in four continents. Um, I have done thousands of radio shows and hundreds of TV shows in all the networks, uh, MSNBC, CNC, uh, <laughs> the Clinton News Network, I can't think of the other, oh, Cult News Network, yeah. Uh, CNN, <laughs> I know there you well. Go. Um, and I've also debated Sean Hannity on Fox, done some things with them, flustered him, and um, and BBC, TV, and radio. Anyway, Big Sky, all all of that all around. Rye TV, Italy. I forgot you were on and, Hannity, by the way. Hmm. I forgot you were on Hannity, by the way. Yep, I was uh, on the last day of 1999 on a national show. Um. And it was going really well. I was debating this uh, global warming expert, and actually we were coming to a lot of agreements, which I was kind of surprised that Fox would even have that going. And Hannity was very peaceful. He was not doing his usual jump in and cause a snap uh, hullabaloo or something. And so I thought, wow, this is kind of, it's got to it's be building. So I'm, I'm on a satellite feed, you know, over here at Fisher Broadcasting in Seattle. So I've just got a little red light and tens of million people watching me right. across the country and I'm sitting in a little ubiquitous room and hearing it on my earphones and uh, or my earpiece and with the space needle behind me <laughs> and a lot of famous people have sat in that chair I thought that's right um, I'm warming the chair of giants and, and notorious people anyway uh, the and then suddenly I hear Hannity because I couldn't see it uh, what the feed of myself on TV, and I'm hearing Hannity saying, well, 
because I made a statement about something I predicted in 1998 um, in a book called 1000 for 2000 uh, predictions, the new millennium, half the predictions, 1000 were the doomsday and 1000 were the bloomsday. And it was the first book that I put my own personal forecast in to fill it out. And I, um, I started talking about how in the first five seasons of the new century, hurricane seasons, um, either Miami or New Orleans might be inundated and destroyed by a, the first supercharged global warming hurricane. And that pushed his button at last. And he kind of went, well, he kind of cut in and said, well, well, Mr. Hogue, aren't you a, aren't you just kind of a doomsayer? And I did the thing you never do on, on radio TV. I just said, no, and left it silent. <laughs> oh, no. And I wasn't being snarky. I literally was just sitting there looking in. And I just went, no, like that. I said, just like that. And he said, well, well, I mean, you talk about the hurricanes and this and that. And then suddenly I was compelled from my heart to interrupt Hannity. And I said, have you read my book? And he went, ah, uh, well, and then I interrupted there you again. Go. Uh, well, for those who have read my book, they, and then I explained, half the prophecies are about doom, half about Bloomsday. And that gives an indication, since many of them came from the same people contradicting themselves that we have free choice if we live in the present and any he kind of went well well i i yeah i did and there were some things there i said okay let's break the commercial <laughs> 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 so so it's not over yet i I'm, I'm unplugging i guess the interview's over i'm unplugging and suddenly the phone which would be the producer's hotline oh it's never I'm over thinking, I pick it up and I go, hello. And and I hear this whisper. I can hear Sean Hannity in the background doing the next segment. It's the Fox studio. And I'm hearing this person, the, the woman who is the producer, and she's whispering conspiratorially. She says, I just want to tell you something. And, and I want to tell you for all of us here. Um, it's almost ever, impo it's impossible usually for anybody to fluster Sean Hannity. And we just want to thank you. <laughs> wow. So what to do? Um, and of course, uh, 2005, the fifth hurricane season saw her Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. There I go, buzz killing my own joke. I love that. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm still, I'm still thinking. Yeah. Where can I get footage of that interview? might be well, somewhere I've been on YouTube. trying to look for it on oh, YouTube. Or is it off somewhere? I, mean, I found a lot of my stuff on YouTube. I mean, I found the one that I did in November of 1995 for Fox that uh, was Prophecies of the Millennium, where it, 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 the, we were talking about a lot of things, and it was all different traditions. There was also, we had CIA people there. I think we had Ollie North as well. And then we had the Woo Woo Wing, which I was a part of. And we're all talking about the future. And the theme that often came up is, is there going to be a second attack on the nine, uh, on the um, Twin Towers? Right. Which they had been attacked in 1993, in February of 1993, yeah. by the big truck bomb. The first time, right. Fall. Yeah, and it didn't, although it caused damage and smoked out about 50,000 people with smoke inhalation. And so the question was, is this going to happen again? And I said, well, according to my understanding of Nostradamus prophecies, the towers are going to be going down the second time. And I, I wrote a book about, about the 12 years of evolving my writing. It's all documented of where I started to talk about this, these couple prophecies of Nostradamus that are probably going to be about uh, a terror attack in New York City when these hollow mountains go down from the air. From, they're struck from the sky with a great scattered explosion, um, and they go down and plunged into their, plunge like they call them the hollow mountains, they, they will be seized and plunged into a boiling cauldron. And I thought, well, that's, that's Nostradamus being 16th century filtering picturesque, you know, that what does he mean by a boiling, like a boiling cauldron? 
And the t word cuvee, which also in, in old French means cauldron, but it's used more in modern French is simply tub. Um, so the process, it's, it's a story of detective work. It's called Nostradamus uh, Premonitions of 911. And it's available on Amazon. Um, you can just type my name in and see it. And it's there. And by the way, John, since we are talking about the past here, and I know, and I know we're going to wrap up pretty soon here since we are coming to a close, but I thought let's have a little bit of fun, uh, of fun here. And John, I got to say, the first time I heard of you was back in 2000, and it was an interview that you did back in 1998 with Art Bell. And, you know, that was a very different time, a very special time in history that won't ever be recreated. And I had a chance to listen back on some of those shows just recently. And uh, some of the things you talked about really uh, reminded me of what's going on now or has already happened. And it's it's pretty, pretty wild. And of course, on a side note, it's too bad Art Bell isn't alive to have experienced what's going on now. I think he probably would have been a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah, I think... Uh... I, I would, uh, yeah, I would think he'd definitely be, it's, um, yes, we, we, it's all documented. Right. And, um, the, I'm trying to think of a, now you're flustered. No, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not flustered. I'm, I've, I, the way I do these interviews is the way I do my private readings on Zoom using a little bit of astrology that's sent to me through astro.com free and looking at uh, divination tarot, something that I haven't done one-on-one -on -one with people uh, until a few years ago. I, I had ceased to do it for 26 years. I did that in the early 90s because there was this opening to a global empathic connection that was like scorching me like the sun coming too close to it. And it oh was my. some, some reason that I could, I had to realize that, okay. Um, I had to look and understand very subtly how our expectations of ourselves and others, and how we want the future to be. In fact, the ones, the expectations, the very subtle ones that guide are the roots of our ego identity are there comes a point where one has to go through a process of observing the very roots of that through self-observation to find a no self position a place of pure consciousness that reflects things perfectly without being a part of them at all but completely there and reflected intensely and perfectly but without judgment just acceptance just love is that the thing that made me scorch was my expectations most subtle that people should change, that people ought to love each other and not go to war, that people should hear and heed the warning signs of all this coming, that, you know, my feeling lonely at that time about feeling so alone in a crowd of right. people that couldn't hear it is the agony of seers. But it's also the ego trip of Sears, subtle ego. And for some reason now I can understand after what has evolved since those 26 years. Mm -hmm. And people kept asking me if, will you ever start reading again? And I said, I, I don't think so. But then a medium never opens or closes these doors. So I really am not, I am the mailman. So I can't say what the mail is going to do. Understood. Right. And so, and so the thing is, I just, I just, um, I had to, I said, I don't even know if there'll even be a sign. And that's when it really came to a point where this work that I do now is absolutely out of control. I had no idea that I would share what I shared in the last hour to us. We appreciate, well, I appreciate it that was, tremendously that you shared that with us. Yeah. It was a unique voice that came to and, and and even though it's a lot of the stuff is probably upsetting you i feel it i feel everybody um it's consider it like a travail of a mother giving birth 
when the when the pains of birth are happening there they can be agonizing and birth potentially has a danger of dying in sure. the process of giving birth to children it happens less now but not in the developing world it's just as bad as it was before the industrial age and so but there's always it's not a hope because it's a reality i'm not for hope i think it's a four letter word and if you drop it you also drop hopelessness and find something else that is far deeper and far higher to perceive things with and you know the birth the birth the trauma for the parents of the birthing process they always have an inkling even in their genetics that something beautiful will come out of this a rebirth a child and in the same way in a collective sense what we are about to answer with all its pains and breakdowns of what we have known are our necessary travails for the birth of the aquarian age the age of science and knowing not of blind faith and believing and um uh, and so science means to know not to have faith but to know from your own personal experience and ultimately the aquarian age is about your own personal sovereignty when when the aquarian age happens it happens and nations will disappear centralization of the world that's happened in the piscean age will begin to unravel and ultimately will lead to no nations except individual people and they will have to be sovereign unto themselves in their interconnection and reactions in community with other people nations and so all of all of this has to first go through a birth process and i've come to a point in my work where i'm not those subtle questions of you should for myself and others were finally illuminated and have just dropped on their own and that has helped me actually become even more out of the way for what is happening and writing and speaking and having a radio show like this now where i said so many powerful things that i have not said like that before. right so i felt i was also listening to it as it was coming through this body mind um you were so in the zone that's all the zone of the zone of divination can come and anything that can trigger it is fine that's why a lot of astrologers hate the fact that i never go into a lot of the other games of astrology because i've learned from one of the sloppiest astrologers ever lived but he was one of the most accurate michel de notre dame um, who was also pilloried in his own time for being, <laughs> for his mistakes in astrology because he was severely dyslexic uh, i am as well but not as bad but but it really what i came to understand about his work was he might have gotten it wrong in how he sometimes expressed it the astrology but what he said would happen happened so i started to understand that divination it's it's about using any technique to get yourself into the zone and once you are there you go you go commando yes exactly <laughs> You're not cloaked by anything and anymore I, and i didn't Take want into the zone and i didn't so, want to interject very much when you are in that zone by the way i, I know i i sense that and i thank yes, you yes no I worries think. no worries and because a lot of people a lot of including Art Bell, didn't have any inkling of what that was. <laughs> used to step on my lines all the time. Well, it, it's <laughs> it's fun. It's funny you say that because I remember you and Art actually had a, a very public sort of a um, uh, little bit of a yeah, fight there at one time. The end. It was the end of our association. It happened in early October 2013 uh where he i he was and then i very publicly called him out for what he had been doing for the last six months uh pillaring savagely coast uh, coast am and 
uh, George Nuri, the host, and make it very public. And what triggered me was he said, you should have kept this private. Oh, my. And I said, well, Mr. Bell, you have not been keeping this private for six months. You even had a major Time magazine report where you're, and I quoted it to him. I said, you've opened this. You've opened your fair game. You've made this a very public situation. And I'm getting tired of all the frightened guests that are worried that you'll switch them off. But, uh, you know, you're being you know, in that, for whatever reason, he was being a bully on that. I just had to put my foot down and say, you know, this is chapter and verse, what I see you've done. And, you know, it was about time. And, as my, and I say that people are complicated. I'm not binary in my look at people. People have all the spectrum of Hitler and Jesus Christ and everything in between. So, so I still love art, but um, I will call a spade a spade. I hear you. If it's necessary. And I do it out of compassion. I'm not like fired up right now about, That's it, about, okay, like, yes. about it. It's just, you, you, you made that point. You obviously saw that strange show. And I really, yeah. I kept quiet mostly in the show because I wasn't quite, figuring out what was wrong with art but uh um that that basically but in in you can read it all at hogue prophecy of the archives yeah, it's all there I, it's all there oh. our back and forth and three things and three uh articles where i just responded to his things back and forth and it's actually very instructional I now um the th thing I want to also add is that um, I I am open, and if you go to hogueprophecy.com... Wait, John, hold on. I, I have to interject you with this because I will feel remiss if I did not bring up her name. During this whole episode, there was one name that did come to mind, and I have no idea why, but the name Sylvia Brown kept coming into my mind. What are your thoughts and opinions on one Sylvia Brown? Rest in well, peace. I met her the day after the midterm elections in Oregon doing a major morning show in Portland, and we were in the green room together, and I didn't actually, we didn't actually know each other at the time, but I had an interesting story about that. She was there with her lovely husband, oh, and they okay. were really nice, and I was sitting next to her, and the point when I was starting to go silent to go into that empty space that I go into whenever I do TV or radio or readings, the world or privately online, um, uh, I could sense her suddenly as, as things were expanding, no thing this was expanding out of me. She kind of looked and I could see her out of the corner of her eye and looked at me and kind of like, whoa, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and and no, she, uh, I met her. It was, she went out, uh, the, the host made a statement after my thing where, where she went out, where he says, and now he's going to refute everything. Mr. She's going to refute everything. Mr. Hogue said, and her husband came up in the wings and said, no, 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 that's they're lying. She's not going to do that. I mean, you know, the, the so-called press, um, the, uh, so, so that was my only experience of her understood um, understood mm -hmm. and uh but it was a very beautiful experience i wrote at hope prophecy i have a i have an obituary article about her that uh i've also have one that i'm presenting in my next wave of hope prophecy subscriber articles uh, on the uh rest in peace james randy who was made a career trying to destroy mine <laughs> that's true <laughs> self he self-proclaimed enemy of Mr. Hogue um, and and his uh, disciples, Penn and Teller. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, Penn and Teller. Who had me as nut job number one. Um, yeah, they didn't really like you. Opening yeah. pre preview show of, I won't say it on, it be, you know, bull. Bullshit. Party. It's okay. Yes. Okay. I, you can say it first. <laughs> I you can don't say know it. what you're is there but uh yes it was called the bullshit it was called penn and teller bullshit good show by the way <laughs> and it was penn and teller it's a shame that they <laughs> it's a shame that they uh didn't like you very much though john well the thing is the thing about james randy i talk about it in this in this thing uh um james uh, being their their 
chief disciple, uh, um, their, their, their master, and they were disciples. Um, James uh, had tricks that he used to do, because he's a mentalist, um, where he always made sure that no one would, he would always have the last word in any debate. Mm. Documentary is just the way he did it. And uh, I, four times I tried to get him to do what Frontline does in PBS, a four, what I call a four square uh, debate. I make a statement, he responds. I respond to his statement, and then he can, or, or if he wants to, respond finally to that. Then he makes a statement, I respond, he has to respond to that, and I have last word. And it's been so many times when they edit these things with so-called skeptics, which are cynics in skeptical clothing. I mean, that means they are front-loaded prejudice before investigating. The ancient Greek word for cynic, uh, well, for skeptic is skeptikos. It means to simply investigate. There's no front-loading of blind belief or debunking. Um, and so, and so, uh, so there was a time where we must have been on the farthest points physically on the lower 48. He was living in Florida. I was up in the Pacific Northwest where I was. And FX Channel was trying to be a go-between between us. He, would, he didn't even want to talk to me directly. Um, uh, probably because in many shows, the very mention of my day <laughs> made him have meltdowns publicly. Probably, so. yes. Uh, which is rare for James. James used to put that really intense stare, stare uh, ray, ray gun eyes at you as his mentalist uh, show business thing. And so I'm, I'm kind of happy to number myself uh, with the, boon, the spoon bender and me are the only people that would kind of make him lose his cool. Banachek? But, but uh, Yuri Geller. Oh, okay. Yuri Geller, right. Yeah they kind of made each other famous and then i kind of was an also ran that came into the mix but uh uh but i also said so he wouldn't go to that they 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 it looked like we had it all arranged and then i said okay now mm -hmm. now the moment has come mm -hmm. i want that all in writing i said and then they said oh no you're going to crimp our freedom to do whatever we want I oh said, you know that you know they're going to say that to you freedom to right. turn it into a dog and pony show and I don't give it to you. Right, right. You right. Have the freedom if you want me, and you just wasted James and my afternoon uh, trying to get this to happen. But I imagine James was on your side on that. And the other time I tried to get him was on a really bad um, documentary that actually, because it was so bad, a lot of people, I got a lot of positive feedback from it. It was called Nostradamus, a Skeptical Inquiry for History Channel Discovery. And in that one, he, um, uh, we tried it again, but this time they were going to end it with James and I in Yale uh, debating before, you know, a lot of the young people sitting there who many of them in that crowd probably are in people's cabinets or senators and who knows at that time in the late 90s. Um, and and so, but I said, look, then the show has to be changed. If you want an hour, it's going to be a real time debate. And you tape it without editing so that James is not uh, given, uh, James is treated as fair as I am. And, and it would be so educational, it would be so wonderful to have the two of us up there and we'll do the four square debate. Well, um, they didn't want to do it, James, and then I said, well, then I'm not coming. That meant James is not coming. So he, James sent a secondary person and then another Nostradamus scholar who, well, I, Anyway, he, he went there. It's not somebody that I, um, I, I'll just simply say this, that he, uh, in my view, is the kind of author and writer who is under the illusion that, and to quote him directly, that Nostradamus can never be wrong. And uh, that's the, the epitome of a blind uh, believer in Nostradamus. And what that means to me is that he will always find something that he thinks Nostradamus is telling him when in fact it's just it's just like if you go and lay down in a grassy field and look at puffy clouds and you you see a giraffe in one cloud and a monkey in the other and then you write about it and there it is that's what the clouds were um but if he were with me I would say no I don't see a giraffe or a monkey I see a wildebeest and a <laughs> a crocodile so and then we could have a, a completely silly uh, uh 
argument that children have over cloud gazing. And that is where the 99.9% of all the authors and a lot of the dilettantes in Nostradamus are. Well, they're don't stuck. worry, John. There's still adults that look in the cloud and think they saw Jesus, so don't worry. Oh, of course, or anything. <laughs> but it, what's wonderful about that and what's wonderful about a study of Nostradamus is that you really are constantly daily confronted with what you project. That's all about perception. That is true. If you do and, pay attention, and, the universe does send you signs in a very weird way. Yeah, I mean, it's a fine line. It's an art to know the balance between what you're projecting and what's actually coming through. And it's taken me 40 years to... Um, it's a 40 year journey I've been on. It's crazy, uh, John, talking to you. I mean, I, I've listened to you since the 90s. And, you know, I always imagine talking to you through a landline, not through the internet. Yes. And, and now I, my, my dark brown beard uh, is turned uh, Dumbledore ish. <laughs> and in your honor, I'm actually growing my beard out right now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't say it's a Gandalf uh, look because uh, uh, given my body type, it's more like Dumbledore, the latter day Dumbledore. I dig it. I dig it. And <laughs> not by the way, Mr. Harris, not uh, <laughs> Sir Harris. Yes. And <laughs> who John. I loved in Cromwell, one of my favorite. Movies. And John, as we finish up here, I, I do, I, I must tell you, I do have your book, 1000 for 2000 Startling Predictions for the New Millennium um, from Prophets and ancient and modern by the way that that book was published back in 1998 i still own a copy today wow and it's still somewhere in my in in my room it's somewhere in here probably in the closet and uh, john i must say listening to the shows you did back with art early 90s before y2k that feeling of something big is on the horizon yeah. i think that feeling yeah. has returned the, the same feeling many people had before y2k uh, is here again yeah it's uh you see in y2 gate uh that was kind of i considered that a, a success uh as a prophecy person uh because i saw i was on a lot of shows yes all you were through the latter half of the 90s trying to warn people about the danger of this not me and others and i wasn't alone in this and you know it's exactly it was one thing i can cite in the field of prophecy that i consider a success story it, it's it's when People, whether they think it's woo-woo and silly or not, the important thing was that it got attention to a real problem of the 2-0 reboot, which the following year in 2001, there were a lot of things that shut down, but they were ready for it. But uh, it was saying, you know, if we don't get that reprogrammed, all computers are going to go haywire by the end of you know, 1999 when 2-0 comes up and the systems don't know how to deal with that. And, and we were laughed at, and that's okay. Sure. People could, could have their entertainment. But, but it finally kind of got into the roots of things, and people did change it. And I consider that, for all the people that warned about it, we are happy, I would say from my side, I'm happy to be considered uh, an alarmist fool of the village, a village idiot, uh, for making the statement because I'm living in a world that didn't have the electricity come down. In fact, I would even say that the, the way I'd like to end my career is where I scared everybody straight. <laughs> and, and a lot of things that I warned would happen never happened. The world's fine. And I'm sitting rocking on my fence as a village idiot, just quite happy with everybody saying what a bad prophet I was. Not a bad journey, though. No, not it's been a, bad a fun ride. You live, I mean, life yeah. is a journey to, from the alone to the alone, from here to now. We didn't speak about it earlier on, but you know, John, in my opinion, you lived a tremendous life and still do. I mean, think about how different your life could have been if you followed in the footsteps of your parents. Well, it wasn't possible. Um, I what wasn't actually possible for one of my parents either um i mean I, well you were and i both were the <laughs> you were a talented <laughs> opera singer India, me first and i brought back the buddha disease and she got infected and she went off and we both became disciples of osho sure but i mean in regards to your career as being like an opera singer you you have a great voice i have heard you sing before john yeah some of my biggest audiences have been on coast to coast am <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you have a great Figured, voice. Unfortunately, in Luciano, even Luciano Pavarotti, who I met, wonderful man. Um, uh, you know, I don't think even he had an audience as big as mine. <laughs> <laughs> he should have. <laughs> well, John. He's definitely a much better singer than most amazing tenor I think has ever sung. Right. Well, John, we are at a close here. And in closing, I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I will just say I really have enjoyed our talk here tonight. It's quite an honor and a privilege to finally, finally get a chance to speak to you here. And you've conducted interviews for countless radio shows, hundreds of television shows. You've been all around the world. I, I don't know how soon you'll be able to go around the world again, but I certainly yeah. wish you the best. And if you have any final words or anything you feel yeah. that we missed, please go ahead. The stage is yours yet again. Well, I, I'd like just to close to say that um, uh, I am, if anybody is interested in getting a reading, just go to hogprophecy.com. Also look at my books there. It's H-O-G-U-E-P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y.com. And you'll see here at the beginning, Hogue Ratings in red. And uh, just just click on that uh, that email and just put Hogue Reading on your email. And uh, I will then contact you by email and send you the available times, how to pay, all of that online. I do Zoom. It's about a 90-minute reading. It, uh, and it has an astrological dimension to find out what your body-mind vehicle is doing. And it goes into the deeper, the witness, trying to deal with who's watching all that inside, driving, soul drivering. And, and then the other thing, too, is that uh, I, I write every month a wave of articles. It's about 125 articles a year, about a quarter million words. And it comes out once a month or it binds two months into one, like this year, this one, because of the elections and the books. You also get to read, if you are subscribed for just $60, um, you can, uh, and you, all you have to do is go to Hogue Prophecy and you can see how to do that too. There's links for that. And uh, just follow the green eye uh, uh, icon and, and read that and click on that. And it'll take you to PayPal and you'll be able to get, see, I'm doing something a little low tech but it's good because of all the censoring that's going on. Right. I actually send it out as a like an e magazine, uh, as a PDF file. Okay. That I can attach to your email um, that you send me, the address that you send me, and then I just on my own with my own server, uh, I'm to, so that people can freely read and I can freely use my speech. Um, I, I uh, send you these PDFs for now, and and these they cover all kinds of things that are going on in the in politics, in science, in social, all around the world, and it's illustrated. Um, there's often often a lot of great cartoons in it. <laughs> and I try to be funny as much as I can because you know if you can't laugh at Doomsday what can you laugh at exactly <laughs> so 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 yeah you just go there and it's it's just like five dollars a month for 12 months and then you'll be on for another 12 months and uh and the reading also you can uh check out the reading too and you can have a one-on-one -on, -one on zoom with me yeah just like you see on other shows that'd be great and by the way in the chat room cr user says john hogue is very much appreciated i've been a fan for decades thank you yes lots of people that and lots of people I, love you there john i love them back <laughs> yeah, they appreciate you well john once again i do want to thank you tremendously for being a part of the program i will invite you back on again i, I had a great time with you and we deserve another round here indeed all right brother well stay safe and don't get covid19 and stay away from the rest of the world there john well, being a double Scorpio, Scorpio <laughs> rising in a 12th house, uh, <laughs> I, I'm fine being alone. Me too. But I have a lot of Leo too, so I know when to party. Love that. John, you are a great man. We'll talk soon. We'll see you, Michael. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. Mahalo. Good Mahalo. Night.
And there he goes, boys and girls. That was the one and only Mr. John Hogue. I do want to uh, thank all of you out there for listening today. And those of you who will listen for the very first time, we hope you enjoyed your stay. Please come back very soon. If tonight's episode resonated with you and want more content, please divert your attention to patreon.com forward slash Michael Deacon or simply send a $5 donation via PayPal. There will be a link in the description below. And I will personally send you some episodes. Those of you who already did that, I've sent some episodes out and I will continue to do so. Everyone will get their product, I promise. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you have not done so already. Take us on the road with you, by the way. Search the Michael Deacon program on all podcast platforms and that is where you'll find the show. Special thanks to John Hogue and, of course, all of you in the chat room and, of course, the mods. Lilith, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Make sure to come back very soon. And I'll be making a return very soon myself. I'll be back tomorrow with John Kelly. Once again, thank all of you out there for hanging out with me uh, here tonight. Those of you who will listen to the podcast rendition of this program. Thank you so much, international listener, uh, international listeners. You know who the hell you are. I appreciate all of you crazy bastards from around the world. I really do. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time. Good night, everybody.